Hey guys, it's Cassie here with Math OMG. Today we are going to be working on applications of vectors, which are super cool and have a ton of application. And after you're done solving this problem, you're gonna feel so smart and so accomplished. So I'm excited to do this with you. I felt so smart and so accomplished when I did it. However, if you don't know some of the background skills, you're gonna be totally lost. So I put a list of here of the videos that I've made that are gonna be helpful that you should watch first before you watch this so that you're not lost and confused. Other than that, I am excited and I hope that you are as excited when you're done watching this and not <laughs> confused and totally annoyed. So let's talk about this application problem. It's great because it has several different types of application within one problem. So it says an airplane is traveling at a speed of 500 miles per hour with a bearing of 330 degrees at a fixed altitude with a negligible wind velocity. When the airplane reaches a certain point and encounters one velocity of 70 miles per hour in the direction north 45 east, what is the resultant speed and direction of the airplane? So when we talk about vectors and resultant, let's kind of draw what's happening here. So you have a airplane and it's traveling. I'm going to do the airplane in this pink color. It's traveling 330 degrees. So when we give bearings or northeast, that's on the compass, not the unit circle. So that means we're at northeast, southwest, and this is 0 degrees, 90, 180, and 270, and then we end at 360. So if we have a bearing of 330 degrees, that puts us in quadrant two. So we're about right here. So I'm gonna label this as P for the airplane. So the plane has a magnitude of 500 miles per hour. So that's how the length of the plane vector. And it is 330 degrees, so that's about the right location. And then we know the wind has a magnitude of 70 and it's north 45 east, so north, and then I go 45 degrees to the east, so that's directly in the middle here. And that's my wind, I'm gonna label that as W. Now the cool thing is you have an airplane and you have wind. So if we think about that, if the airplane is traveling in this direction and the wind is traveling in this direction, that wind is going to pull that airplane up a little bit. So it's gonna be a little bit more vertical. So how we represent resultant vectors is we draw in a parallelogram. I like to draw in the parallelogram versus the heads to tails. Draw in a parallelogram, and then in green, I'm gonna draw the resultant vector. So if we start at the origin, and we connect to the corner of this parallelogram we've just created, this green vector, that's the result of the airplane and the wind affecting each other. So the airplane has moved a little bit more vertical and it looks like, because it looks a little bit longer, it's probably going a little bit faster. So what that means, this green vector here, that represents the result of P and W being put together. And when we have two vectors that create a resultant vector, we add those two vectors together. So the first thing we observe is just all of this. This is all the information that we're given at the beginning. Some other things that might be helpful to write down is that the magnitude of the plane vector is 500 and the magnitude of the wind vector is 70. And then our mission is to find the resultant speed and direction of the airplane. So that's the green vector. So we're trying to find its resultant speed. So the resultant speed is going to be the magnitude of this vector. So if I can figure out the magnitude of this green vector here, that is the resultant speed. So that's one of the things I need to find. And then the other thing I need to find is the direction that it's traveling. So it looks like it's somewhere in between 270 and 360, We're about right here. So we need to find what theta of our P plus W is. And then our game plan for doing this is going to be to do a couple things. Unfortunately, we don't have P or W. We don't have their component form. So we need to find what is P in its component form. So that's the A, B form. What's W in its component form. So that's the A, B form. 
Then we need to add them together, find the magnitude of that new vector that we've created, and then we need to find theta for p plus w. And again, finding magnitude and finding theta, that's all in those previous videos, the ones I said to watch first, so that you'll know how to do that. All right, so let's do this. So we know that our airplane is traveling 500 miles per hour at a bearing of 330 degrees. So we have this really nice formula that helps us find the components of a vector. It's the magnitude of that vector. So we're going to do the plane first. So the magnitude of the plane times cosine of the angle that it's traveling in. And then the magnitude of the plane times sine of the angle that it's traveling in. So we know the magnitude is 500. It was given to us because that's how fast it's going. So that's going to be pretty easy to plug in. 500 cosine and then the angle, this is where it gets a little annoying. So whoever created the compass versus the unit circle did not get together and say, hey, let's make one circle of 360 and let's have everything line up. So unfortunately that didn't happen. So you have to look at the circle you were given and try and figure out what the angle of that airplane is. So what the angle of the plane is on the unit circle. So we know it has a bearing of 330 degrees. So we need to figure out if we go this direction, the unit circle direction, because that's the direction you go on the unit circles. This is zero on the unit circle. If we go this direction, what is that angle? So here's kind of the way I think of it. My bearing was 330 degrees. So this piece right here that I'm drawing in green, this is 30 degrees because I traveled 330 degrees and then to get back here to north, I would have had to go 30 more. So this portion is 30 degrees. And then when I go to find my angle that would be on the unit circle, I know this portion here, that is 90 degrees. If I start at zero and go to here, that's 90. And then I went an extra 30. So 90 plus 30 gives me 120 degrees. So 330 degrees as a bearing is 120 degrees on the unit circle. And our formula needs us to plug in the unit circle measures, not the bearings. So I plug in 120 to both sine and cosine. And then I just am going to use a calculator from there to figure out these measures. So the vector of the airplane is going to be negative 250 and then 433. I'm just going to round to the nearest whole number. So we know the components of the plane. Awesome. Now we have to find the components of the wind. So the wind vector has the same formula. I need to find the magnitude of the wind times cosine theta, magnitude of the wind, sine theta. So the great thing about the wind vector is that it is in the first quadrant and we know it's 45 degrees right here. So either direction I go, it's going to be 45 degrees because it's in quadrant one and it's halfway between. So I know that my theta for my wind is 45. So I do 70 cosine 45, 70 sine 45. And since sine and cosine have the same measure at 45 degrees, these are both going to be the same, which is 49.5. So my wind vector is 49.5. So that's kind of the hardest part, getting all of that kind of figured out and understanding where those numbers are coming from. So now that we know what our wind and plane vectors are, now we're actually going to be solving for that resultant vector. So my wind vector was 49.5, 49.5, and my plane was negative 250, 433. So I need to figure out what they are together to make my new vector. So that's this green vector here. So together it's negative 200.5 and 
and it is 482.5. So that's pretty cool and I think this is really interesting. I don't know if anyone else does, but I was I thought this was really interesting that this right here, the component, this represents if my airplane is traveling at a certain miles per hour in this direction, the first component is telling me how fast I'm traveling horizontally. So I'm traveling 200.5 miles per hour horizontally and since it's negative to the west as I travel 482.5 miles to the north, which is, that's pretty cool. Like that's cool information. So I was stoked. I thought that was really interesting and cool. That's why I think vectors are so awesome because they have such good application and it's one of those lessons as a teacher I can finally say like you will actually use this like people actually use this in their lives fairly often so I'm excited to teach something like this because I feel like it's super practical so now that we have our plane plus wind vector so our resultant vector this green vector if we figure out the magnitude of it that tells us how fast it's going so we're gonna find the magnitude of this vector so the magnitude is we just take the first number and we square it and then we take the second number and we square it, put my decimal in the wrong place, and then we square root that amount. So our vector, I'm just going to throw that in the calculator. So once we plug this in the calculator, we get 522.5 miles per hour. So what that means, like putting this into context, you have an airplane that's traveling this direction and the wind is going this direction. So the wind makes it go faster, but it also pushes it more north, which if you're traveling in an airplane and you're trying to get from A to B, you probably don't want to go more north. You want to go more the direction of your location. So we know that it's going faster, but from our diagram, we also know that it's moved north a little bit more. So we want to figure out what angle am I traveling at now? How has the wind affected the angle or my bearing? So let's put this up here. My resultant speed I just found is 522.5 miles per hour. And then I'm going to erase this and we're going to talk about how to find the angle. How do we figure out then what's the angle that I'm traveling at? So my recommendation Actually, I need to have, let me put this back up here. We're going to need this first part of my resultant vector. So this is my resultant vector. And I'm going to try and figure out what angle I'm traveling at. So I always solve with cosine because remember, this portion right here represents the magnitude of my vector times cosine theta. I just like using cosine. I feel like there's less things to remember when you're using cosine. So I know the magnitude is this amount. So I know that negative 200.5, this is also called A, A equals the magnitude of the vector. So 522.5 times cosine theta. And then I just solve for theta. So I'm gonna divide by 522.5, divide by 522.5, and then I do cosine inverse of this. That gives me my angle. So remember, inverse cosine, that function is awesome because it tells us angles. So my theta is going to be equal to 112.6 degrees. So that looks about right. If we look at this green vector here, it looks like it could be about 112.6 degrees. However, that's my unit circle measurement. I really want to know what's my bearing because if I'm giving this to someone who's flying an airplane and using a compass, 112.6 is not the same on the unit circle as it is on a compass. So I need to figure out what's the angle going this direction. So again, I kind of use the same little formula to help me. I figure out the distance between my vector and the y-axis because if I'm on my compass I know that this is 360 here but if I'm on my unit circle I know that this is 90 so if I go from 90 
and the whole thing is 112. If I know here's 90, but this whole thing that I've drawn in, this green vector is at 112. I know this blue piece is 112 minus 90, which is going to give me um, 22.6. Now I'm going to draw this again just because I think it's helpful. So if I know that this piece right here is 22.6 and I know that on my northeast southwest this is 360 I know that from here all the way around to here is going to be 360 minus 22.6 so I know that I am traveling at a bearing of 337.4 degrees so that's my theta or the direction of my airplane and I'm done I've used so many skills that I've learned with vectors to solve this one application problem. I hope that this was helpful and you feel a little bit more comfortable with it. If not, maybe try watching it again. If that doesn't help, please let me know in the comments. I can't help you if you don't tell me where I'm confusing you. So let me know in the comments if I said something wrong or if I made a mistake or if I just skipped a step and you have no idea where a number came from. Leave it in the comments. I'll respond back and let you know so that I can help you understand vectors a little bit better. Also, make sure to subscribe to my channel because I will keep throwing out videos on vectors because that is what I'm teaching this unit. And thank you so much for watching. Have a good day. Thank you guys so much for watching my videos. If you want to get better at math, subscribe to my videos here. If you want more information on math, click on my website link here.